Our gospel reading this morning is taken from the gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning at verse 34. You can find this on page 25 in your pew Bible. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher! Which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The gospel of the Lord. Christ. Some folks like to make lists. Some do not. Some folks like to look at lists. And they can be found, all kinds of lists. In fact, I have a book of lists. They're organized in this book by number, beginning with three. I guess if you have only one or two, it's not a list. Ends with 24. The first uh, answer to the lists under three is who were the first, who were the three sons of Adam and Eve? 
The final list is 24 letters of the ancient Greek alphabet, in case you need to know that. I have a list of the 100 most important events of the 20th century. Number one, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. The largest single stemmed tree by wood volume and mass is, as you would guess, a giant sequoia. The largest living entity is the Great Barrier Reef, although it is composed of many different species. So some want to argue that the largest single living organism is an aspen grove near Aspen, Colorado. You may know that aspens are all interconnected under the ground, although others want to argue that the largest aspen grove is actually 47,000 trees covering 100 acres near Pando, Utah. I got all involved in finding a list of the animals who've lived the longest. I know you want to know this. <laughs> Adwiata, an Aldabra giant tortoise, was on top for a while, but he died in 2006 at the age of 250 or so. But some wanted to argue that Adwiata is not that old, and at the top of the list was actually Harriet, a Galapagos tortoise. She died in 206 as well. She was 175. So now there's Jonathan a Seychelles giant tortoise who lives on the island of St. Helena and is 182. So at the moment, evidently the oldest living reptile. But all this kind of got confusing, and I will have to say that records on when animals were born is a bit sketchy. <laughs> so went on to other things. At the top of the list of 100 classic TV shows, I Love Lucy's number one and MASH is number two. At the top of 100 best movie songs, Over the Rainbow is number one and As Time Goes By is number two. The top movie he wrote is Atticus Finch from the movie version of To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, you see, you can find a list of almost everything. And sometimes it's kind of interesting trying to move myself on to something a little more serious, I tried to find out how many laws there were in the Jewish religious system at the time of Jesus. That search was not successful. What I do know is, of course, at the heart of the Jewish law, the five books of the Torah, Torah Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, but in addition to those five books, there are extensive, even at that time, written commentaries called Madrashim on each book. So that would have provided countless laws and interpretations of laws that a faithful Jew would have tried to follow. So it's not just Ten Commandments, but a long list of things to do and not to do. So, while we often malign this poor lawyer who got shoved to the front by the Pharisees, it's not such a bad question after all to ask Jesus what's at the top of the list. Now, I know they had an ulterior motive. They were trying to trip Jesus up. As Matthew lays out the gospel story for us, this is the fourth of five controversy stories that Matthew tells after Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. Each story illustrating a way in which they try to get Jesus into trouble. But the question is really not too far off. What's at the top of the list? And Jesus nails it. Love God with your whole self and love your neighbor like you love yourself. Simple, straight, clear. At the top of the list is love. Love for God, love for one another. So, how's this play out? Well, a couple illustrations. This, of course, is stewardship season. 
In lots of churches, it's stewardship season. You can just hardly go anywhere to worship without the preacher talking about money. Because the truth is, budgets are being prepared for the next calendar year. Pledges are being sought to support that work. If you come to lunch today, not only will you be given lunch. See, there is something. There is free lunch. Today, free lunch. And great fellowship. But also information about our 2015 budget. And you will be asked to make a pledge to support that work. What each of us does with that information is between ourselves and God. You don't sign your pledge card. Only God knows what you've made, what commitment you've made. Now, stewardship is not just about money, I believe, although money is involved. Stewardship actually is about love. Recognizing how much God loves us and responding to that love with money given through, through God's church. Way back in the ninth chapter of Genesis, just after the great flood, God reminds Noah that God has given Noah and his family everything. God loves us and gives us everything. So at the top of the list is our love for God. Second way in which this list of priorities plays out in many Protestant and Reformed churches, this is Reformation Sunday, a time when we remember early Reformers leaders of the Protestant Reformation. The beginning of the Reformation is usually dated as October 31st, 1517, the day when Martin Luther nailed 95 complaints or theses on the door of the parish church in Wittenberg, Germany. Many of the cries for reform were intended to return to the top of the list this love for God and love for one another because at that time many believed that love for the organization of the church, not the ministries of the church, but the organization of the church had been at the top of the list and that that was wrong. Uh, you find in your bulletin which you've, uh, an insert which I'm sure you've just laid aside and didn't pay any attention to. Pick it up, take it home. It's about the work of John Knox, who was another one of the early reformers. John Knox was born about 500 years ago. Actually, the truth is nobody knows exactly when he was born. A lot of people pick 15, 14, so here we are. We don't even know what month he was born in, so we've just picked October because that's Reformation. Poor John. But John was an eager avid, enthusiastic supporter of the Christian faith and the Reformation. One of the hallmarks of his work was to insist that the Bible be translated from ancient Greek and Hebrew and Latin so that folks could read it for themselves and learn directly about God's love for them. <laughs> Knox was heavily involved in English and Scottish politics, and those of you who read English history or read novels set in this time period may have learned some things about him. He was violently opposed to the leadership of Mary, Queen of Scots, who, as you know, was a devout Roman Catholic. Uh, Knox got himself in pretty big trouble. He was actually in slavery for a while and was sentenced <laughs> to row on a galley ship for a couple years, and he was in exile on the continent where he got acquainted with John Calvin, another reformer. But in 1559, he returned to Scotland where Protestantism was spreading rapidly. Worship became centered on Bible reading and preaching, and there was continual in emphasis on education so that people could actually read the scriptures for themselves. Knox was quite a, quote, intense, religious, argumentative, democratic, fearless, intolerant, and forceful 
advocate for what Jesus called the two at the top, love for God and love for one another. Scott and five other ministers wrote the Scots Confession in four days. This is one of the creeds, confessions, and catechisms that's in our book of confessions. We're going to use the first paragraph as our affirmation today. It's written in very old-fashioned English. Kind of roll your eyes that I made us say all these. But the confession begins with an affirmation of the centrality of God. The Scots Confession was ratified in 1560 by the Scottish Parliament. And it is an old affirmation that we should worship only God, trust and cleave to God, and serve God by loving one another. So, in one respect, the list for the top things Christians do is easy. Love God, love one another. In other respects, it's a lifelong challenge, which is why we come to worship, to learn, to express our gratitude to God and to be inspired. It's why we study, to learn, to explore ideas. It's why we go out into the community and the world using all different kinds of methods and doing all different kinds of work from time to time but always going because Jesus said that it was number two on the list after loving God, which of course is number one. Now we all are well aware that it's pretty easy to get sidetracked in our lives and in the church. In the church, we can argue about who can be in and who should stay out. We can argue about how we spend our money and who decides. We can argue about styles of music. And sometimes we have even argued about what color to paint the parlor. I was a witness to a 45-minute discussion at a session meeting over whether or not we would ever allow an artificial flower arrangement to be used in the sanctuary. It was perhaps not our finest moment. Because at that moment, we had obviously forgotten what Jesus said about what should be at the top of the list. You shall love the Lord our God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so may indeed these be at the top of our list.